Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps Peepers, Roberts and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. A couple quick announcements, and then we get into, uh, for me at least, some longer stories today. Oh, me too. Oh, nice. It's going to be a big episode. I like it. Uh, now for this week's merch announcement. Um, we heard some of you wanted Hawaiian button-up shirts. <laughs> I <laughs> got those uh, messages, so we we got them. Actually, we got two. Uh, the first, he is a fun cryptid pattern featuring cute critters from Logan's Mind. Looks like they're clam-shaped spiders, uh, very round bats, vampires, two-headed snakes, and more. Comes on a really cool Hawaiian-style button-up collared shirt with a left breast pocket. Also have a very cool Western-style cowboy button-up featuring oh classy God. flower skulls. Uh, these are hand cut and sewn, so please allow a couple extra weeks on delivery. Head to badmagicmerch.com, check these killer button ups out. And also, a quick note from the Art Warlock good news is we were able to go up to 5X. Yay! On these because they're handmade. Oh. Uh, we just had another conversation with our main supplier about 4X and 5X sizes in general in the store. Trying very hard to add these back into our selections. We appreciate your patience. If you're not aware, we moved from pre printing all of our designs to a vast majority of them being printed when you order. And that limits our selection on larger sizes, but we're hoping to roll out a solution very, very soon. Yeah, Logan has been working on it, working on it, working on it, like constantly like poking them. Yeah. And he explained to me that like part of the problem too is that it like, while our store is awesome and like big and robust, there are just bigger stores. And so they mm, sweep they in and them up. they get the, you know, uh, supply before we can get to it. Yeah, yeah, still uh, a couple years out dealing with certain supply chain issues. Uh, yeah, I see it still like on so many things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple stand-up tour dates left for the theater tour. Cleveland and Columbus, April 7th and 8th. Cleveland almost sold out. See you soon, Ohio. And then, and then please come watch a new hour of stand-up to be uh, being built. Starting off in Phoenix, April 21st and 22nd at Stand Up Live. May 4th, 5th and 6th in Bloomington, Indiana at the Comedy Attic. And then finally, May 11th, 12th, and 13th at Comedy on State in Madison, Wisconsin. Then uh, then I'm off for the summer uh, outside of one date in Spokane, which I'll get that date later. But it's all, uh, everything but the Spokane uh, up at dancummins.tv. And I'll get more dates added here soon. I'm so excited. I've never been to Madison, Wisconsin. It's cool. It's a very cool college town. I'm yeah, excited for that definitely one. Definitely cool vibe there. I mean, all great shows, but I'm just saying that's the one <laughs> I'm looking forward to. And now you have a charity announcement and then we're off to horror. Okay, let's do it. All right. So this month, uh, of, of course, per usual, we are recording in advance. It's only the middle of March right now, but we are recording into April. So the amount to be determined, but the April charity will be Big Table. Uh, they're... Uh, Mission statement is Big Table exists to see the lives of those working in the restaurant and hospitality industry transformed by building community and caring for those in crisis, transition, or falling through the cracks. So in short, Big Table exists to serve hope to everyone in the industry who faces all of a sudden like a life-altering moment where they have to decide between like picking their kid up from school because they're sick or working yeah. and then not being able to pay the rent, which like right. I've been there. I was a server for many, many moons. I have friends and family who still work in the industry. Uh, reading the stats are terrifying. It's like one in six people are living below the poverty line. Yeah. They're working. They're working full time. But like right. that industry is hammered. So it's a, it's a cool system. They have various locations across the United States. So if you're interested in learning about what they do and or starting a chapter in the city where you live, if you're in that industry, they are looking to expand. You can visit big-table.com. That's big-table.com. Um, big hyphen table.com. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> um, what fan submitted horror do you have for us today? Or do you want me to start? You know what? Actually, I just want to say one other thing. Just a reminder, yeah. the scholarship fund applications are due by 424. So you've got okay. just a few more weeks to get in there and you can visit badmagicmerch.com. Look for the scholarship yeah. tab at the front to redirect you. And now my horror. <laughs> I have... 
two stories this week. I think you are really going to love the sort of existential vibe of the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, When we go on trips, is it possible to bring something back with us? Mm. It's a really cool story. I'm really into it. It has been... I've been re- I read it months ago and have just been sitting on it. Yeah. And it just has like really hit me hard recently. So I'm like, okay, this is a good time to talk about this. And then my second story, uh, we're going to talk about a bracelet and, you know, the ability for energy to be attached to an object, which we really haven't done in quite a while on my side of the yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm excited to explore that again. Uh, yeah, very cool. Sorry, had a uh, a burp that oh, re- decided how- to show up right as I was supposed to talk. How dare you be human? <laughs> uh, my first two stories uh, based around something I, I don't think we've explored here before to my memory. We've talked about it maybe as far as the Insidious shows, but this uh, concept of astral projection. Oh, If we have, I just can't remember which episode it was. But if you could train your mind to actually be able to take your consciousness out of your body, leave it behind as some sort of empty vessel, could something else enter in, in its place? And again, it's a concept explored in horror cinema and horror fiction, but I but I can't remember coming across a story like this before in the land of supposedly true paranormal horror and, and the stories we tell here. After that, back to Hawaii for a little bite-sized bit of horror. Some paranormal encounters alleged to have taken place at the Honolulu Police Department's Ooh, Training Academy. We're going to Honolulu in November. Yeah. Yeah, I got some shows out there. A uh, lot of horror on those little islands. Yeah, I got to get the uh, I got to get the fall dates. I got to get all that well, stuff. Well, we're there's there's logistical things behind the scenes as to why yeah, we're not yeah, doing yeah. that quite yet. Um, that first story, actual projection, I I think that we covered it a little bit on my side. I'm like having a flashback well, of a story and like a mom and a grandma. Can't remember, but. Yeah, I know I know we've talked touched. about it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we've talked about it just talking about movies we like. Yeah, I just can't remember the exact uh, story. I know I had one for sure on my side, but. Okay, okay. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of then. Um, after showcasing your fuzzy socks, which really aren't that fuzzy, but they're no, cool. Uh, oh, can you read that? Um, such a strange little, no, I can't. You fancy bitch. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> such a strange pre-story ritual and tradition now, if you really think about it. I know, I who, know. Who would have anticipated socks becoming part of a horror show's get ready to listen to the story's ritual? You know, and, um, and also I want to thank our fan, Katie, for yeah. handing these off to me uh, at one of your shows. I, I actually get it because it's like, um, you know you're about to be scared or or they're going to try to scare you. Yeah. So it's sort of like... Uh, Someone who wants to take advantage of you, they like butter you up to then get what they want out of you. So to me, it feels like that, like we get all cozy and comfy so I can boom, scare you. And I guess it's it's adjacent to like covering yourself in a blanket. Which I also do. Putting something on to kind of get ready for that. It's a protection. Yeah. Protection socks. Yep. A little bit of protection. Makes me think about just the rituals we have. Like uh, I always feel weird if I, I do it sometimes, but I always feel weird if I do a stand-up show in the same exact clothes that I just wore traveling around that day. Oh, it's like yeah. even even just switching the <laughs> the shirt. <laughs> this is a really old, outdated reference, but it feels a little bit like um, Sylvester Stallone just like switching his hat around to get ready for arm wrestling and over the top. <laughs> it's like he puts himself in that mode. God, how old are you? <laughs> uh, old enough to have seen that show as a kid when it was new. Well, I I never saw it. I know what you're talking about, but I've never seen it because I am a young spring chicken. Are you? You're younger. Bro, <laughs> not even 40. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, on, uh, let, let's get into this first story. On Scared to Death, we regularly tangle with the mysteries of the human consciousness. Uh, whether the consciousness is preserved or distorted in the form of ghosts and spirits, or our consciousness playing tricks on us, what makes us us has always been a central concern of the paranormal world. What part of us could transcend death to become some type of spirit? What part of us can a non-physical being embed itself in and attach to us and on and on? Also, we know from many stories here that attempting to access one or another's consciousness, whether through rituals, spirits, uh, games, hypnosis, trying to contact the other side, uh, it can be dangerous. That's why, at least to me, astral projection is as frightening a prospect as it is enchanting. Though astral projection can mean different things according to different practices, it's generally believed that astral projection lies in the splitting of our consciousness among various different planes of existence. And just like you can get harmlessly hypnotized by, say, driving, which is sometimes called white line fever, actually, uh, 
Oh, yeah. I think that happens to me. You know how I get so sleepy in the car? Mm -hmm. People will zone out and lose time and be like, where was I the last three minutes? Just yep. kind of like lulled into a trance-like state while they drive, uh -huh. kind of on autopilot. Yeah, that's why I don't like to drive because I'm like, Am I, was I falling asleep? Am I okay? <laughs> um, astral projection supposedly can be similarly harmless to that. Um, say you're talking to someone, but really thinking about going to the grocery store, doing your taxes, so in-depth that you feel as though you're actually doing what's in your mind's eye. And then when you come back into your body, so to speak which has been running on this kind of autopilot, you can feel like a jolt as your two forms of consciousness collide. But astral projection, if it is a real thing, of course, can also be dangerous according to some who truly believe that you can actually leave your body. Not just think about being somewhere else in your mind's eye, but actually be somewhere else. Have your consciousness literally vacate your physical body and travel. Split yourself in two in a way. Kind of like becoming a ghost while you're still alive for a little while. In the most extreme supposed instances of astral projection, people have been said to actually become truly separated from their own consciousness, fragmented in space and time with both parts or even multiple parts, yearning to become whole again, but unable to reunite. The scariest part about this, flashed on the plot line of the uh, first two films of the Insidious horror film franchise, there's no telling who or what you might meet in the murky realms beyond. If you wish to do it, this is how one online source says it ought to be done. Before doing some astral traveling, always visualize a protective circle around yourself. Imagine a white light around you. Visualize two large white hands coming down and gently cleaning your aura from head to toe, removing all negativity. Without that step, so says the source, it's possible for something to interfere with your protection, and you may not know what it is or what it wants until it's too late. After that first step, next adopt a comfortable position in a quiet place where you won't be interrupted preferably upright in a chair, as you might fall asleep if lying down. Use meditation music without drum beats. Clear your head of random thoughts. Focus on your breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. Visualize yourself breathing in tranquility and breathing out any and all disharmony. Focus on each part of your body, starting with your feet, finishing up at your head. As you breathe out, think, my body is relaxing. When you feel very relaxed, choose a phrase or, mant or mantra to repeat over and over to yourself, such as, I fly, I float, I rise, or count down from 10 to 1. If your mind starts drifting, simply return to your mantra. You will enter a heightened state of simultaneous awareness and relaxation. Your inner self and senses become super aware, but your body becomes extremely heavy and relaxed. Continue to repeat the phrase or mantra that you've just used. Clear your head of everything and repeat it over and over again until you notice that you've actually left your physical form behind. Initially, this realization that you have projected may force you back into your body. Uh, this is all said to get easier the more you practice. As you begin to leave your body, you will get the sensation of movement as if you are in a moving vehicle. This is the sign of your astral body beginning to separate from your physical one. A myriad of lights and colors will appear now in front of your eyes. Now learn to use your thoughts to move around in the astral plane. When it is time to return to your physical environment, simply make the mental decision to come back into your body. Visualize yourself being back inside your body. Count from 1 to 10, focus on each part of your body, and begin to move them all slowly. Do not hurry since you may have been physically static for hours or allegedly even days. Time is said to pass differently in different dimensions. Still think that astral projection is just a myth? I get it. This is a lot to accept, as none of it has been scientifically proven. Or maybe you do believe in it, but think that it's something harmless, something fun to pass the time and test the reliability of this thing we call consciousness. Whether you don't believe at all or you do believe but think it's harmless, this next supposedly true story might change your mind. Time now for the tale of a door that can't be closed. I don't know why I'm posting this. Well, I should say that I do know why. I'm afraid. I'm very, very afraid. And I'm worried that if I tell someone, even my therapist, they will simply chalk it up to years of anxiety. It's right there in my medical record. Diagnosed with generalized anxiety and PTSD at 16, OCD at 19, paranoid delusions at 23. I'm like a walking receipt for proven mental unreliability. But what my therapist and caseworkers don't know is that I really do have a good reason to be afraid. And recently I've discovered that I've long, long had a good reason. I just didn't know it until now. Just in case anyone decides to look me up, I'll say in advance, don't. You can call me Maria, but it's a pseudonym. 
The rest of the names here will be pseudonyms too because my story has to do with a case that was pretty widely reported in the news a couple decades back and I don't want anyone harassing anyone else involved. I know more than a few people who have tried to sell it to various true crime producers over the years and I've seen the toll is taken. Anyway, from my childhood, you wouldn't think that I would become a dysfunctional person, the one that I am today. I was born into a happy home, two loving parents, an older brother and a younger sister, and two family dogs. We practically had a white picket fence and Christmas lights twinkling on the house for half the year. But everything changed when I was 14. I had been friends with Bobby since I was seven or eight. His family had moved just a few doors down from my house when we were in elementary school. I think his dad worked for a telecommunications company and they moved a lot. Bobby and I became fast friends. We were both little kids. I mean physically little for our age. In a town full of people that seemed to be tall, gorgeous, and more often than not had expensive haircuts and highlights, Bobby and I were small, with dark hair, asymmetrical features. Kids at school sometimes thought we were brother and sister. When the, nightmare, when the nightmare before Christmas came out, there was a lot of teasing. I bet you can guess why. But Bobby and I didn't care. We were outdoorsy, adventurous kids who loved to play in the tiny creek behind our houses, constructing fictional worlds where we were Robin Hood types roaming the woods in search of bandits. As we got older, we started spending most of our days inside. Maybe all of the talk about the nightmare before Christmas had gotten to us deep in our psyches because now we loved all things horror, Bobby especially. He had a collection of horror comics that, if it were still around, I'm sure would be worth thousands of dollars. Action figures, too. And his basement had a computer, where we spent probably hundreds of hours looking at forums where people related their stories of performing mysterious rituals in the hopes of unlocking the mysteries of other dimensions. By the summer after 8th grade, Bobby had become obsessed with something called astral projection. When hanging out after school, he just wouldn't shut up about it. Just think, Maria. He'd say, his words a rush of excitement. What if we could go anywhere we wanted, wherever we wanted, whenever we wanted? What if we weren't stuck here with the stupid JV basketball team and the JV cheerleaders and the JV whatever the fuck, but could go somewhere that was actually cool, that was actually interesting, and we never had to ask our parents or try to get money or anything, and then we could tell everyone the secret of how we did it, and we'd be famous, we'd be on TV. For a while, I was just as excited about it as he was. And then suddenly, I wasn't. It was May, the sun was shining, kids our age were playing outside and volleyball, riding their bicycles, and for the first time, I wanted to be one of these other kids. I didn't want to be an outcast anymore. I finally realized that nobody made us outcasts. We did that to ourselves. There were plenty of cool people around to hang out with, if only Bobby would let us. But I could tell he was not interested. He'd consider it a betrayal. So I started making plans by myself. I asked my parents if it would be cool if I went to a sleepaway camp, all girls for the summer. Because I'd never asked for anything like that before, they agreed, happy to send me someplace where I'd spend my days making friendship bracelets, riding horses, and swimming in the lake instead of inside a dank basement with only Bobby and the internet for company. I was planning on just going and writing a letter to Bobby from camp, explaining that a spot had opened up unexpectedly, I'd had to jump on it, but on the morning I left for camp, right when my dad was loading up my trunk full of supplies into the car, I felt a flash of guilt. One second! I called over my shoulder as I raced to Bobby's house. I'll be right back. Bobby's house was on the corner of the same block. I went around the side and let myself in the back door like I always did. Bobby? I called into the silent house. Both the cars out front were gone. Bobby's parents must have been at work. Bobby, you home? There was no answer. And then I began to notice that something was off. All the curtains were drawn, leaving the inside dark and musty. There were a pile of dishes in the dishwasher, crusted food that must have been days old, still stuck to the plates. As I looked, I thought I saw some kind of insect scurry between the plates. And then, jolting me, I heard a thud downstairs. I ran down the basement steps, my heart pounding. Had Bobby's family been kidnapped? Were they being held downstairs in the basement? These were the kinds of thoughts my 14-year-old mind thought, and not how I, a girl who still weighed under 100 pounds, was going to save them from some vicious kidnapper. Bobby! I yelled, Bobby! Hey, Maria. The basement overhead light wasn't on. Instead, a bunch of candles illuminated the space. Most of the stuff that had always decorated the basement, the couch, the TV stand, had been pushed aside. Now there was just a dingy carpet, the computer, but no desk, and Bobby sitting in the middle of the room looking perfectly fine. Or at least he looked fine physically. His hair was a little greasy, and his eyes had this wide-open, wild look. Hey, I said, what's going on? Where are your parents? They went to visit my aunt and uncle for a couple of days, he said dismissively. 
said like, pizza's in the fridge, here's a hundred bucks, take care of yourself. I guess when your son's a total loser, you don't have to worry about house parties. He grimaced and looked bitter. Hey, that's not fair, I said. You want some help cleaning up? I, I remember that my dad was waiting. Actually, it's not a great time because, yeah, whatever, Bobby interrupted. Listen, I think I've cracked it. The secret to astral projection. I was reading last night and one person on the forum said that my instructions were all wrong. You know the thing about visualizing the cleansing energy? That's apparently some fail-safe so that you don't fuck up yourself mentally. But if you really want to astral project, you have to be open to anything and strong enough. And I'm definitely strong enough. He grinned. In the flickering light by the candles, his face looked a bit monstrous. I'm going to try it again, he said. You in? I, I got to... I trailed off. Even if I hadn't had to go to camp, this all seemed wrong. The candles, the basement in disarray. Why had his parents left him here? They were always a little less than present, but this didn't seem right. Where were they, really? But then I started to feel sorry for him. Maybe he was acting out because he needed the attention. Like my brother who'd gotten a tattoo on his 16th birthday, which turned all of our family into going to family therapy. Maybe this was his cry for help. From down the block, I heard my dad's car horn honk. Listen, I'm going to camp. There was a cancellation and I just found out I got in. I lied. But I'll be back in two weeks. Just wait for me. I promise we'll do it together. I smiled at him, expecting to smile back. But he just looked at me evenly. Okay, he said, his voice empty of all emotion. Later, I would wonder why I didn't tell anyone what was going on. I guess I could chalk it all up to the narcissism of childhood. How all of us think we're Superman at a younger age. I thought that I could go to camp, come back happier than ever, show Bobby that there was a whole world of fun out there to be had, and everything would be fine. As it stood, I didn't even make it through the second week. I'll remember the night I left camp for the rest of my life. I had just finished a day-long hike with my new friends, and I was returning to camp beaming. We'd sung songs all day, made up silly nicknames with each other, and now all of us were looking forward to a big dinner and a hot shower. Then when I got back to camp, a counselor jogged over to me. Your parents are here to see you, she said, and she wasn't smiling. She led me over to the administrative building while I tried to think why my parents would be there. Had someone in the family had an accident? My brother? My little sister? Was one of my grandparents sick? My mom and dad were huddled in the main office, their expressions gaunt and haggard. My dad had bags under his eyes, and my mom looked like she'd been crying. When they saw me, they wrapped me up in the tightest hug, like they were never going to let me go. What happened? I asked, pulling back. What's wrong? Is, is it Richie? Is it Sarah? No, no, my mom said, but then looked at my dad helplessly, like she couldn't bear to go on. You can use my office, the camp director said quietly. In the camp director's office, my mother and father haltingly explained that Bobby had murdered his parents. <gasps> the night before I left for camp, he killed them, slashed his mother's throat in bed, then stabbed his father to death in the hallway. When I was in that house, they were already dead. We didn't want to lie to you, my mom said, fresh tears, fresh tears welling in, her, welling in her eyes. I haven't been able to stop thinking. What if it had been you? I still can't really believe it happened. Did you ever think he could do something like that? Shh, my dad said, patting us both in the back. Nobody could have known. Nobody could have seen this coming. They took me back home that night. My father warned me not to look at Bobby's house, but I couldn't help myself. As we passed it, I stared hard. The windows were the same, but dark instead of lit from the inside. The front door was shut and a piece of crime scene tape fluttered in the wind. And then I saw the curtain rustle. It was by Bobby's bedroom window. Is Bobby at home? I asked. No, no, my mom said, turning to look at me. He's at the police station. Or maybe they've gotten him to a hospital by now. He was in there for three days with the bodies. Do not go over there, my dad snapped. Sorry, I just... I just meant that it probably wouldn't do you any good to see Bobby now if that's what you were wondering. He's clearly not the friend you thought you had. I'm sorry, Maria. For the next decade, I was in and out of hospitals myself. My best friend, my only true friend that I'd known for years, a huge part of my childhood, had brutally murdered his parents, whose dead bodies were in the house when I last saw him. That really messed me up. Even years after the house had been sold, demolished, rebuilt, occupied by an older retired couple, I still had nightmares. In my nightmares, Bobby was always sitting there on the carpet, his eyes rolled back into his head. And when his eyes opened, they were black. That was about when I would wake up screaming and for a moment the whole room would seem bubbly, gelatinous, as though nothing, not even the home I knew so well, was real. I tried so hard to put it all behind me. My therapist told me it wasn't my fault, which I tried to believe, and they put me on medication to control my anxiety and intrusive thoughts. And later in high school and college, I made friends, the same friends I'd fantasize about making when I hung out with Bobby, but now Bobby was in a juvenile hospital, and then when he was 18, he was transferred to prison. 
Apparently in the trial, which my parents banned me from ever attending, they'd come up with some theory about how Bobby wanted to use his parents' money to get out of the city he hated, making him out to be this cold-blooded loner killer. But I knew that wasn't the case. I still didn't know what exactly had happened, not until a few years ago when Bobby sent me a letter to my parents' house. Dear Maria, it read, I know you probably don't want to hear from me, or you don't remember who I am. That would probably be the best case scenario in this situation. But if you remember a misguided, short, dark-haired little kid who loved comic books and horror movies, at least until his life became one, and you have sympathy for him, please read the rest of this letter. From the minute I was detained until a few months ago, the hospital and prison had me on a cocktail of medications. That means I've spent much of the last 20 years completely out of it, unable to make sense of what happened to me or my parents. But a few months ago, I was eventually judged stable enough to go on a lower dose of medications and eventually wean off to a very small dose. And what I discovered then was that the things I had been seeing for so long were not just hallucinations. Please let me explain. Do you remember the day you came downstairs and found me in the basement? My parents were gone, I said. I was talking about how I'd uncovered the secret to astral projection. Well, I uncovered the worst kind of secret imaginable. See, the previous night I'd read a post about how most people thought astral projection was about trying to separate yourself from your body, trying to sift through your consciousness until you emerged a, a pure, loose form. But this post said that what it was really was letting go, letting go of everything, including negativity and positivity. Just become a blank canvas. And if you're trying too hard to protect yourself from whatever was out there, you'd never achieve it. And what did I have to protect myself from? My basement? A bunch of dusty old boxes? At least that was my thought process then. So I tried it and it worked. It wasn't like the other times where I visualized floating above my body or flying through the ceiling. Instead, I went down, deeper inside myself, like my body was a door that I had just crossed through into some deeper realm. And through that door was a house. But it wasn't a regular house built up from the ground. It was built in reverse, down into the ground, if that makes any sense. I thought that if I tried to move, I'd wake myself up, like all the other times, but I just gave the slightest mental push and was moving along. I went down, down, downstairs to a lower floor, and then another, and then another. All of the rooms were empty and dark, and it didn't feel like my imagination. It felt like I was really going somewhere. But as I moved, I could tell that things were getting weird. The rooms that were the closest to above ground had felt solid, like real rooms. But as I continued, the walls became the wrong shapes. The floors were longer or shorter than they should have been. Doors were closed, but I'd pass through them. Or I couldn't get through open doors. Some of the rooms felt like they were expanding and contracting like they were breathing. And then I saw it. The black door. None of the other doors had been particularly vivid, but this one was. It looked so much more solid than everything I'd been seeing on my way down. It was by all accounts a normal door, but it had an intense, but I had an intense emotional reaction to it. Fear, but also soaring happiness like a balloon was expanding in my chest. And then without me doing anything, the door just opened. I walked through, feeling that bubble expanding in my chest, euphoria coursing through my veins. I'd wanted so long to feel special. And now this amazing thing was happening to me. And then I heard a noise behind me and I turned. Something was shifting, watching me in the dark. I couldn't see it. It kept shifting though, I could sense it. I could tell it was much taller than me, so much bigger. Maybe it was the whole house and this was its face or its most alive part. And I've been wandering through it the entire time. Without thinking, I turned and ran. Now I know that I should have made sure that the doors were closed, but I didn't then. I ran all the way back up the house, back through the familiar looking rooms, but this time they were all the same black as the door. And when I opened my eyes, I was in the basement, drenched in sweat. The clock said it had been two hours. My heart was still beating like I was getting chased. But everything seemed fine. I was okay. I was in my house. I went upstairs, had a slice of pizza, and tried to forget about it. But then I started noticing things, like how all the rooms in my house seemed to shift ever so slightly, looking just a little wrong. Some things that were wood and metal before now had the texture of skin. And in the corner of my room, when I tried to go to bed, there was a hole. I don't know how else to explain it. It was like a hole in the very fabric of sp space and time. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, it was bigger. At first, it had been a pinprick. Now it was the size of maybe a golf ball. I did the ritual again right away. I was so curious to try and figure out what the hole was, what it meant. And then I don't remember anything for a few days. And when I woke up, my parents were dead. The entry stopped there, but there was more in the envelope. When it started again, it was in a different color pen. Bobby said, Sorry, I had to collect myself. I know this doesn't make any sense, Maria. It didn't make any sense to me. When I was on the medication, they told me that the hole was a hallucination. But I can still see it now. 
that I'm off the medication. It's still following me and it's gotten bigger and something inside wants me to go through it. I know it'll take everything from me until I do. If you don't believe me, please ask if you can see any of the files about my case. They'll show you I'm right, or at least as right as I can be when I have no idea what's happening or why. Please, Maria, for old time's sake, your friend, Bobby. Three days later, it was in the papers that Bobby had died by suicide, hanged himself with his bed sheets. I didn't show that letter to anyone. For the next months, I would try to rationalize it. Bobby was crazy, I thought to myself. Who knew what he was saying? Who knew what was going on in the mind of someone who killed their parents in cold blood? But still, I requested the files. One of my friends from high school, a girl named Amelia, now worked in the city records office and sent them to me. I made myself a cup of tea and opened them on my laptop. The first was the autopsy report, complete with photographs. I closed my eyes as I skimmed past the photos and looked for the report. There it was. Bobby's mother had had her throat slashed in bed. Based on the injury, the arterial spray, and the lack of defensive wounds, she'd probably never woken up. I said a quick prayer for her and moved on. Bobby's dad had died in the hallway. At least that was what I'd actually uh, thought at the time or heard, but according to the report, he died behind a locked door that Bobby had broken down. He'd also, according to the autopsy, died standing up with Bobby above him. I looked again and frowned. That didn't make any sense. Bobby was a short kid for 14, shorter than me, and I'd been 4'11". Bobby's father, on the other hand, was 6'3". Maybe there was another killer? I scanned the documents trying to figure it out, but the knife only had his fingerprints on it. It was all him. But now, had he become taller? But how had he become taller than his dad in mere minutes and then shrunk back down again? At the very bottom was a link to a folder titled Video Evidence. Suddenly, I remembered that Bobby's family had a camera installed in the living room. They'd gotten it after a maid had stolen some of the family's antique silverware. With trembling fingers, I clicked a link. The first few moments of the footage were grainy and still, but I still shuddered. The living room was so familiar. I'd spent days there, so many days there as a kid, camped out on the floor watching as many movies as we wanted. And then Bobby entered the frame. Parts of his body were obscured by shadow, but I could still see the knife in his hand. It looked, however, like he held it limply. Not the type of grip, you know, he would need to stab someone with it. His mouth was open, his eyes rolled back in his head. He kept moving forward, and that's when I noticed he wasn't really walking. He was more like gliding, his head bobbing like a marionette. I paused the footage then. I was done with it. Whatever had happened, I had to put it in my past. There was no bringing back Bobby's parents. There was no bringing back Bobby. A horrible thing had happened in my childhood, but what could I do about it? What could anyone do? But I kept having nightmares. I kept feeling like something was watching me, or like things just weren't as solid now as they seemed before. I accidentally overdosed on my pills suddenly, even though I always made sure to take them when my timers went off, meaning I was losing track of time now, or seeing something or somebody was messing with my phone. So I decided that the only thing to do was to watch the video to completion. Four weeks after originally seeing it, I played it again from the beginning. It started the same. Bobby came in, gliding strangely, his head lolling on his body. But then I noticed something I hadn't seen the first time. Instead of the open doorway to his kitchen, there was now a little door separating it from the living room. The door was a deep, solid, dark black. As Bobby moved forward, the door creaked open, and something shadowy slithered out. Something with dark, glittering eyes. And it wasn't looking at the camera. It was looking at me. I slammed the laptop shut, but part of me knew it was too late. Whatever had gotten Bobby in the astral realm had followed him here and now was following me. I hadn't noticed that thing the first time I watched the tape because it hadn't been there when I first watched it. Ever since seeing the footage again, I've been waking up in strange places, losing more time. My therapist says it's just getting hard. uh, It's just me getting used to a new medication, but I know that's not it because now, and I know I sound so crazy, but a tiny hole has opened up on the edge of my desk and it's getting a little bigger by the day, and I don't know how to stop it. One of these days, I'm afraid it's going to be big enough for me to move through it, and I'm afraid I will, even though I know when I do, unimaginable horror will be waiting for me on the other side. Yikes. That is not the ending I anticipated. Yeah. I thought she was going to like solve the case, <laughs> and it was going to be this, like, I mean, not a happy ending, but sure, like sure. A, a nice, you know, wrapped up bow on top. Here's the answers. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, losing time is so terrifying to me. Yeah, that is a really scary kind. I mean, whether it's paranormal or, you know, mental illness, Mm -hmm. just that you're not in control of your mind for whatever reason is, yeah, it's terrifying. Terrifying. What a a strange, surreal thing to happen to, you know, you're going about through your day and then all of a sudden you're just in a different spot. And it's like, I would imagine it would feel like you just teleported there. Right. But then you look at the clock and like three hours have gone by and you have Literally no idea where you've been. That's such a scary, scary thing. Yeah. I mean, oh God. 
I don't have ah. pi- I don't have pictures connected to the story, but I do have some pictures just about astral projection. Gentle with that, Layla. <laughs> this first one is a uh, uh, photographic imagining of how it would take place. Okay. The person laying in their bed, and then their consciousness, their spirit, leaving their body. Mm-hmm. This next one, super creepy vision for what life could look like out there in the astral plane. Why, why does it look like that? Who knows? That's just somebody's imagining of what it could be like. Like, like you float up there and then there's all these like bodies like trying all to get you. All these other spirits, yeah, is trying it? to invade yours or who knows, yeah. And then, and then this last one, just a screenshot from some of the horror encountered in the further Ugh. in Insidious. I, I don't think we saw that one. Oh, I've seen Insidious several times. This, There's multiple Insidiouses, mm-hmm, aren't there? Mm-hmm. I think this is from the first one, though. That doesn't look familiar to me. Oh, really? It's from the first or second. I, th- I thought it was, I thought it still said the first. I, my, I haven't seen the movie in a while, but uh, I was like, oh yeah, I, I do remember this. God, those smiles. Mm-hmm. That uncanny valley kind of thing. Yeah, the further, a vast, dark, and empty dimension, which is an important location between heaven, earth, and hell in the Insidious franchise, a place that can be traveled to via astral projection. The, the entire story kind of had me thinking about Stranger Things, like the Upside Down, mm-hmm. and uh, not, like, like just the most recent season. I cannot think of the girl's name with, like, the red hair. Oh, yeah. Uh, she, uh, Ethan Sam. Hawks. Oh, Sam is the character's name, right? With the red hair? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like Sam. The, the one has to like she has to listen to the music so yeah. she doesn't yeah get taken or whatever. Oh, you're thinking of Maya. Hawk. I was thinking of Maya Hawk. You're yeah. right. Yeah, who's also really cool. Um, but she, you know, in that, in those episodes, it's like she kind of like fl- like her body goes up, mm-hmm. right, and mm-hmm. then she floats into something else, and it's like her body is here, but she's also over yep. there. She's like, like she split that way. Uh huh. Yeah. So that seems. I mean, I don't know if that's what they were going for, but it definitely. Well, I guess. She wasn't trying to astral project. But it is that concept of like a sp- split consciousness in a way mm-hmm. or, or, or split away from your physical body because, yeah, her physical body is still in this realm, her spirit, if you will, somewhere else. Yeah. And when that thing is able to can kill her spirit, it could kill her physical body too. Yeah. I wonder why in the ritual it said like to li- in the very beginning you were talking yeah. about listen to music, like meditative music, but no drum beats. Yeah, no idea. That was odd. I don't know if it just kind of gives you like a foreboding sense, like maybe that makes you feel like you're in danger. Bum, distracting or something bum, bum. like you know what i mean yeah 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 uh, i don't know so i thought that was odd uh okay other things that i was thinking about the like the rules about putting white light around you like that mm-hmm. i literally do that before we record it's always like that was one of the very first things that friends of mine that are like spiritual healers or energy workers were like listen when you sit down in that chair just take a second and just think about what are you looking at no, just the dolls. It's oh, <laughs> I was like, ah, um, but just like, you know, like being surrounded by a white light and, you know, thinking about like, I'm safe, I'm in mm-hmm. control, I'm protected. I mean, I think that Bobby kind of fucked himself by not doing that, mm, you know? Hopefully. Yeah, th- th- that was a, the kind of story where I'm like, please let it just be nonsense. <sighs> I don't know. Because, okay, when I was younger, my mom's mom, my grandma kiddo would, uh, whenever I spend the night at her house, she would read me this what we would call now like a meditation, but she was like, yeah. oh, do you want me to read you the sleep story? But it was just like, you're lying down. You're th- like, and it would mm-hmm. like, have you focus on each part of your body from head to toe. Mm-hmm. And now you're floating above your body. I'm like, was she trying to get me an astral project? <laughs> like, because they're it's like, weird. I have a very, very vivid and active imagination in like, mm-hmm. um, building out scenarios in my head. Yeah. And sometimes I do feel like I'm outside of my body creating these stories or something happens later. And I think like, did I make that happen? Like I, you know, these like weird kind of mm-hmm. like disconnects. And so I don't know. It just, it gives me enough pause to think, I don't know, like if it's something that you can kind of convince your mind and body to do, I don't yeah. think it's that far fetched. I don't know if it's that yeah. dangerous. I don't know if it could cause these other things, you know, in this case to commit murder and right. for something to possess your body. But I mean, I don't see why it couldn't be true. I mean, I guess like whatever matter composes build makes a ghost. Mm-hmm. But like, and we have come across stories that are pretty convincing about like sentient type ghosts, not just an echo. Yeah. Oh God. And and if some kind of sentient ghost is possible, well, then that means that there is a you know like a soul, a spirit, a consciousness, something that can live on mm-hmm. when your physical body is no longer there. And if we're willing to accept that as being true, you know, or definitely strongly possibly true, then it's not that big of a leap to think that like the same thing could happen while you're still alive. You Wait, absolutely. Split. Yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's definitely this is not something I would ever want to toy with. Nah, I wouldn't either. It feels like just a little bit too far out of my control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm being the control freak I am. <laughs> you know, it's just like uh, not a good idea. Okay, the just last thought. Yeah, I was so mad at her parents 
for going to get her from camp. Just let the kid finish camp. It, it, it didn't make no difference. Oh, yeah, because how would she find out about it there? Yeah. And if she did find out about it, well, then she would call her parents. Come I get did, me. I did not think about that, but absolutely. Like, yeah, like they let, her, let her enjoy that last bit of normalcy yep, before yeah. the nightmare starts. Exactly. Like this, like don't rob her of that innocence of this thing that she wanted so badly. Yeah, because it's not like Bobby was loose. No, and it's they, not like she was him. being subpoenaed, like you need yeah, to come true, in. There was true. no reason to go get her. I thought that was a very shitty parental choice. Yeah. <laughs> very mad at them. <laughs> are you uh, Are you ready to head out of the darkness and over to some sunshine? You head out Ooh, to uh, Honolulu now? Take me away, Calgon. <laughs> Always love heading to Hawaii. Uh, in real life, we're here on the show. <laughs> that was a random Calgon <laughs> reference. I don't even do you know. Don't what, remember those I don't commercials? Even, I do, but I don't even know what Calgon is. But I do remember like, Calgon, take me away. Body wash. Oh, funny. I, I would have me- guessed medication. <laughs> 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 no, I think it was like uh, I want to say it was. I'm, I very uh, assertively said body wash, but I'm 99 percent sure it's like you know they would show like a woman in the shower, just yeah. kind of like you know some like coconut mm. kind of flavor. Like ah, oh, I'm on vacation. Yeah, snap okay. to reality. Calgon, <laughs> take me away. Okay, this story is a quicker one. Oh, thank than the last God. one uh, on the island of Oahu's south shore lies Honolulu, ah. <laughs> the capital city of Hawaii. Hawaii, is, as we have learned, is steeped in rich spiritual beliefs and paranormal history. Many locals have no doubt that there is an afterlife and also that the souls of the dead walk amongst us. For many, this acceptance does not uh, you know, do much to make them less scared than the rest of us when they come face to face with entities that are no longer technically alive. Time now for the tale of Hawaii's Haunted Academy. The Honolulu Police Department Training Academy, Kikula Makai, uh, located in Waipahu, opened its doors in 1988 and has been rumored to be haunted from the get-go, with stories of the paranormal even making the local news. Reserve Officer Comer Stamps Jr. talked about the training academy being haunted in a special feature of the local news once, saying, During the day, it's a pretty busy place, with all the officers, training staff, and recruits on campus, but once the sun goes down, the place is totally different. It's dark, no traffic, no pedestrians, nothing. And that's when the strange things start to happen. HPD hires overnight security guards to watch over the building when it's dark. And Stamps talked about the paranormal experiences of his friend, Tony, who worked as one of those nighttime security guards. He said that one night, Tony was doing his routine checks around the training academy when he heard a sound in the distance that caught his interest. It sounded to him like some pieces of wood clacking together. And it was coming from inside the SWAT house. Naturally, Tony went to investigate. And on the way to the SWAT house, he had to pass the canine building. And as he approached, he heard a bunch of commotion from inside. He became concerned that these impeccably trained, usually very quiet and well-behaved dogs, seemed agitated by something. Very agitated. He could hear them barking and snarling as the metal food bowls were kicked around on the floor. And all the time he'd worked at the facility, he had just re- he had not just recently taken the job. He had never heard anything like this before. The odd bark or whimper, sure, but nothing like this. It sounded like the hounds of hell had gotten loose. Despite all this disturbing racket... He was still drawn to check out the SWAT house before fully investigating anything else. As he moved past the canine building and the SWAT house came into sight, Tony could see every one of the wooden shutters on the building opening and closing over and over again, perfectly in sync. And there was zero breeze in the air. The night was still, eerily still. And the way the shutters were closing was so unnatural. They kept closing with so much force he couldn't believe they weren't shattering. The noise was so loud, his ears were ringing from the consecutive crashes. Tony felt more than a little uneasy at this point, but carried on slowly approaching the building. He was certain no one was in there, as he'd already checked it earlier and made sure everything was firmly locked up. Even if someone was inside, how in the world would it be possible for them to make every single shutter open and shut in unison? It made no sense. Tony finally made it to the front of the SWAT house, and when he tentatively uh, tentatively unlocked the main entrance to step inside, everything stopped. The sudden silence was almost more deafening than the constant crashing and the dogs barking. The shutters were now all closed and not a peep from the dogs. Covered in goosebumps, when he peeked inside, he found no one there. Shaking now, he searched the whole warehouse to confirm exactly what he already knew in his gut. There was not a single person inside. He moved on to check the canine building, and when he peeked inside, it was as if all the dogs had been sleeping throughout all of this. And that was it for that night. A couple weeks later, Tony was sitting in the breezeway when he heard a loud car horn nearby. Thought it was a car alarm coming from near the garbage incinerator plant behind the academy. But when he passed the academy's auto repair garage, he realized the sound was much closer. 
And then he saw him, clear as day, looking as alive as anyone listening to the story right now. Tony saw a little boy sitting on a motorcycle and honking the horn. <laughs> Tony told him to stop. The child looked at Tony with a blank expression. Tony took a step closer, and now the little boy vanished right in front of him. But the motorcycle remained, as real as any other vehicle in the area. This would not be Tony's only experience with vanishing people. A couple nights later, Tony had just finished his final checks and patrol of the property. He walked onto the breezeway in front of the facility, sat down on one of the picnic tables to rest for a bit, felt a chill in the air, an odd shiver now ran up his spine. He turned to look at the main security gate and was shocked to see a woman making her way directly towards him. Tony realized that he had never heard the gate open, meaning there was no reason she should have been inside the property. The main gate was locked. He'd done it himself, so how in the world had she gotten in? The woman, dressed fully in white with long hair messily falling over her shoulders, proceeded to walk slowly up the path towards Tony. Judging by the way she walked, Tony wondered if she might be drunk, maybe had taken something, or was completely lost. He called out, waved his arms to signify he was there and wanted to help. But the woman showed no reaction. It was like she couldn't hear or see him. She continued slowly making her way towards him. When she was almost next to him, only about three yards away and still not responding, Tony now felt more fear than concern. What did she want with him? What was she about to do? And then his jaw dropped as she simply disappeared into thin air. His mind froze as he tried to comprehend what he had just seen, another vanishing person. There was nowhere she could have gone. Tony scratched his head, feeling uneasy, wondering what ghost he might see next. He considered going to the security room, reporting the incident to his superiors. As he turned in the opposite direction to walk towards that security room, Tony now froze. Same exact woman was now walking towards him from the opposite direction. He was in shock, frozen in fear to where he stood. And this time, unlike before, Tony could make out her face. Her skin was as white as her dress and she looked angry. Her eyes glared as she stared straight at him. Tony tried to scream, but he couldn't. He could feel his heart pounding inside his chest, could feel himself shaking, but he couldn't move. The woman moved closer and closer until she was maybe two yards away from him and then again disappeared into thin air. Taking a minute to catch his breath and try to right himself, Tony now wandered back to the lawn chair he had been sitting in, decided to sit down, calm down, then call his supervisor to report the incident instead of walking over to talk to him. But then as he moved to stand back up, the woman appeared again, this time sitting directly across the table from him. Now he jumped out of his seat, ran inside the building. In a 2015 YouTube video, the Honolulu PD confirmed that Tony still worked as a security guard, but refused to work at the training academy after dark. <laughs> after being reassigned and probably worried that he was going crazy, Tony learned that he wasn't the only person to come into contact with that woman. Numerous other security guards reported similar experiences. Is that comforting for Tony? Reassurance that he's not crazy? Or does it make it all the more terrifying? Officer Stamps, Tony's friend, said at the conclusion of his local news interview, I know what you're thinking. I'm just some guy repeating to you the stories that he's heard. I get that. But let me tell you something. These things really happened to Tony. I believe him and believe all the other officers who have had similar experiences at the training academy. Hi, yeah, guy. Yeah. And it was a pretty cute little thing that the local news, like, I, I think it was around Halloween. Sure, sure. Sure. But they but they did like, uh, I want to say it was like eight or nine minute special feature. Like they really went hard in like dramatic reenactments and I stuff. I love it. I love it. Which you don't really see much from local news. No, but I mean, it is like a part of, more a part of their culture. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have pictures? I do. So this first one, little pic of the exterior of the police academy's entrance. Uh-huh. And then this next one, part of the academy's grounds at night. You know, I can see how it'd be spooky if you were so alone there. Yeah, it, that's a really pretty photo. Yeah, it is. Yeah, somebody took a good photo there. And then this uh, this final final one is a still from the local news station's dramatic reenactment of yeah. the woman from the story looking at Tony from across the table. Did they ever find out who she was or like who they think she might be? Like a inmate? Or not an inmate because yeah. I guess it was training, but like someone who... Uh, if so, they didn't say in any of the uh, articles that I read. Who are you? Who are you? What happened? Exactly. What happened to you? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to go to Hawaii with you in November. Yeah. And I'm curious if any of our listeners in Hawaii have any stories about the location with which you'll be performing at the Blue Note. The like, Blue Note. What if, what if it's haunted? Ooh. That we've we've so definitely fun. performed in a, a variety, or I have performed in a variety of venues where the people are, you know, uh, adamant that, yeah. the, that the place is haunted. And no one wants to give us a ghost tour. I'm like, do you want it? They're like, nope. I know they get like spooked at these places. Yeah. And that made me think of that speakeasy, not speak. Yeah, no, 
uh, Speakeasy Downtown Spokane. We went with um, Isaac and Courtney. Oh, yeah, yeah. And below, it did kind of spook me where he went, took a little tour. The bar wasn't open that night, but he gave us a little tour of it. And then, uh, and then you know, asked him about it being oh, haunted. Durkins? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he was like, he was like, oh, yeah, super haunted. And he's like, especially under the staircase. And then he got like very serious. And he's like, <laughs> do not go under there. Do you remember that? I remember being like, ugh. Well, no, because I was, was, then I was afraid to go into there. You were talking to Isaac and you and Isaac, I think like held back a little bit because that's when he told him he was going to propose to Courtney. Oh, yes. True. But but Court and I, I was like, we were there and I felt uncomfortable in this space. I was like, let's, I I didn't want to be in there. I didn't like it. It was very cold. It just, it made me not feel great. So I don't think I was really listening to what the tour guide, the tour guide, the (laughs) the general manager was saying. I didn't want to be a part of it. I didn't Mm -hmm. care for it. Uh, uh, sorry, real quick, guys. I have to uh, correct myself. The character we're thinking from Stranger Things uh, is Max, not Sam. Max, that's right. I don't know why I had oh, Sam yeah. stuck in my head. I don't know if I watched something else where she played a Sam, but she looks like a Sam. So. I, I, I believed you. I was with you. I was like, yeah, no, that's right. But this, when this episode comes out, there's going to be so many um, listeners who are like, ah, exactly. Like it's probably been driving them crazy. Yeah, between. I wonder how many people couldn't get through that last story. I, I already sent in an email. <laughs> It is Max. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that show. Uh, yeah, me too. But yeah, so our Hawaiian listeners or people who have lived there, do live there, if you have stories about Honolulu, specifically the Blue Note, yeah. that would be really fun leading up to that show to share those stories. And then I was also just, because Hawaii, I was thinking about Joe Coy had the craziest story. We've talked mm-hmm. about it before, but it's been a long time about yeah. renting a house for his family for a Hawaiian vacation. And that house was haunted as shit. Yep. Yep. My God. Yeah, there was yeah. something really creepy about that story of his, yeah. Yeah, you guys could go, uh, I, I don't know, does he still record the Koi Pond? Uh, I, th- I don't know, actually. But you, I'm He's sure you so know the, the episode still exists. I think Dan, so. Dan was on that show moons ago, and yeah. you could find it, and Joe sh- shares the story there. It's really- yeah, I think at the end of the episode is when he talked about it. Yeah, it was really, truly scary. Yeah. Like, if that experience happened to me, there's no way that I ever doubt if this stuff is real. Mm-hmm. <sighs> <sighs> I was feeling tense during that first story. It really like, um, yeah, had a yeah, creepy, creepy kind of tone to it. Yeah, I'm like, why did Bobby decide that he wanted out? Like, he died by suicide. And I think so, he was afraid of going into the hole. You think so? Mm-hmm. You don't think something else from the hole kind of convinced oh, him maybe, to do that? Maybe. Who knows? It took over his uh, brain. Man. Okay, that story's gonna stick with me. I can already feel it, just because it's so. Um, abstract there do, it doesn't feel like there's i i almost feel like you could astral project by accident mm-hmm. like it, it just doesn't it doesn't sit well with me it's gonna be a long night tonight oh boy i should probably get pretty drunk and pass out okay <laughs> ah, okay are you ready i am okay i'm really excited about this first story um you know some stories just affect you in different ways or resonate with you in different ways and i think like so on in this story you know psychedelics are becoming so much more mainstream yeah we are really talking in science about mm-hmm. mushrooms and their properties and their benefits and how they you know should have been legal a long time ago they Meaning they had so much sex success previously. Right when they and, were legal until 1970, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I think that this story, uh, the timing of it mm-hmm. is really appropriate. Uh, you and I have had some fun trips of our own. You more than me. I just like am recently dabbling in it. But do you ever worry about when you're deciding that like, oh, this is what I'm going to do with my day today, that you could possibly bring something back with you or that something so negative mm. could happen that it would kind of tarnish you? No, I've worried about like, well, I've had some bad trips. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. So far, at least, even though when I've had bad trips that I've really like freaked myself out and thought I was going completely insane and maybe did go completely insane for a little while. And then, but then like, like the next few days, I'm like, oh, nope, too much. Don't want to do that again. But then like within a week, it's like tugging at the back of my brain. It's like, yeah, you do. I mean, come on back. Um, so no, you don't want to have more bad trips. No, but I want I want to trip again though. It's oh like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm but not. But that's uh, like saying like you get so drunk that you're throwing up. You're yeah, like, I'm yeah, never yeah, gonna yeah, drink yeah. again. But then you have a glass right. of wine. You but, just don't go that hard. Totally. So I mean, I do want to trip. But yeah, no, I'm not. I was worried more early on with each one. Like like the first like basically like LSD, uh, you know, magic mushrooms and DMT. A little worried, but not a lot worried, obviously, or I wouldn't have done it, but a little worried that like, oh God, you know, what if I had one of those, you know, crazy trips that most of them honestly are urban legends Mm -hmm. that like, you know, you don't come back from. Well, But the more I've studied it and the more I looked into it and now the more I've done it, it's like clearly my brain chemistry can handle it. 
Like, um, well, that's exactly what I was gonna say. So like, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, I think like bad trips. It's I, it's not that I don't or like you're not gonna come back. It's not that I don't think that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I think what happens is you are predisposed to a mental illness that you were yeah. that you were either aware of and decided to, you know, recreate anyways, or <laughs> right. you weren't aware of and you didn't do your research and you didn't understand, yeah. and then you sent yourself off into a really bad place that your brain. You were going to get yeah. there maybe eventually anyways, but the drug just pushed you mm-hmm. further or maybe it like was like a tripwire, like, well, now you're there. So right. that's why you didn't come back. It's not really the the drug. It's a, it's, it's a drug in tandem with uh, existing brain chemistry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this story, it just, I don't know. I could not stop thinking about it last night. I was working on this by myself. I was late. Everyone was asleep. Like everything felt a little like, oh, I just, yeah. okay. Hey, so, oh wait, do you have your Layla? I do, I do. Oh, okay, you were just My, suffocating no, her in your armpit. Yeah, no, I'm holding, It's it, this is the weirdest thing I haven't even told you about, but um, every once in a while, I don't know what- Muscle uh, twitch? No, it's not even a muscle twitch. And it's so random. <laughs> it's weird, to talk, but um, and it's happened to me ever since I was a little kid, but I'll get like random nipple sensitivity, like maybe it rubs against a shirt. Oh yeah. And my left nipple has been so tender the Did last you, couple days. Have you upped your dose of vitamin T? No, isn't that a side no, no, effect? no, no, it can't be. It's not puffy. It's not that. Oh. It's like, um, it, and it, and it's my whole pec. Oh. And then, and then randomly the, the muscle on the backside of my, my lat on the same side is also really tender. So it doesn't feel good to have my shirt rubbing against my skin. But if I sit like this, I kind of hold everything in place. Oh, you could put a little bandaid over your nip nip. Yeah. It's kind of like the whole area. It's weird. I, I know Aww. it'll go away within the next couple of days. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Hey, scared to death crew. Uh, my confession. I hallucinated a gnome while on magic mushrooms in Texas. And <laughs> this is great. In the early 2000s, and that little fucker has popped in and out of my life ever since. Oh my God. I still have questions and doubts about what happened to me over that time period, but I'm going to try and tell this story as if I'm 100% sure of what I have seen. To this day, I still partake in the occasional mushroom trip, but the question remains with me. When we use psychedelics, can we bring something back with us to our plane of existence? I was living with my sister in a garage turned studio in Lubbock, Texas, when it all started. My then boyfriend, Ken, was living an hour away, and one night, as it happened, he drove to my place with a friend, Bruce. My sister was out with some of her friends, and so the three of us had the tiny place to ourselves. Bruce brought mushrooms. I was stoked. (laughs) It had been a long year during which I was finishing up college and moonlighting as a camera operator at the local TV news studio. I had the night off and we smashed face those mushrooms almost as soon as Ken and Bruce walked through the door. (laughs) I remember hazy details about that night, like finding acrylic paint and making a mural of a fire department responding to a burning building on the fire extinguisher my landlord kept in the kitchenette. Eventually, my sister got home and was on a trip of her own. She joined in and painted a sunrise scene on the top of the toilet seat in the bathroom. (laughs) Then we all went to get some food. I think it was tacos. We were back home and walking through the little gate into our tiny yard when I saw him peeking out from behind a bush. I swear it was a garden gnome in tattered red hat and dirty overalls. He was probably three feet tall and fairly nimble looking with dirty fingernails, a scrunched up face, and a magical glint in his eyes. That's a big ass garden gnome. He smiled at me. I waved. He waved back. Bruce asked me what I was doing in the moment, and the gnome disappeared. I told everybody what I saw, but no one else had seen the gnome, just me. For several days after, I saw flashes of red out of the corner of my eye and shadows that didn't act like normal shadows. My keys would go missing as soon as I'd set them down, and then I'd find them an hour later in the exact place where I'd left them, but only after I addressed the gnome out loud and gave in to his little game. At first, it was a game for me, too. I didn't really believe I was being tailed and tricked by a garden gnome. That's not logical. Gnomes aren't real. About a year later, Ken and I went to Nebraska to visit family. We were driving along a straight, snowy stretch of highway one afternoon with his brother in the car. We were totally sober and out running errands, engrossed in conversation when I saw a three-foot man in tattered red hat and overalls dash across the road. Shocked, I did a double take, and I actually saw him again before he dashed around some debris and disappeared. I was about to, I wasn't about to say anything to the others in the car and was already questioning my sanity when Ken's brother said, hey, did you guys see that gnome looking thing just cross the road? I was immediately sure that Ken had told his brother about my magic mushroom gnome and that they were playing a joke on me. 
But after launching into a very intense line of questioning, I was convinced that he'd seen something. I never told them that I saw it too. I just left it at that because for the first time, the gnome we joked about in my close circle of friends had become real. My breakup with Ken came about a year later. I won't go into all of the details of why I decided to drop him, but for one thing, that good-for-nothing dude didn't have a job and was using his mom's money to buy eight balls of cocaine behind my back. We were back to living in North Texas when I made the discovery, and I moved out of our apartment that night. The breakup was ugly. I still loved him, even though Ken was obviously a piece of shit. Shortly after I took my leave, he said he couldn't stay in our apartment because there were too many memories haunting him. I suspected something else was haunting him, too. Anyway, he went to stay with some of our other friends in town while we figured out what to do about our lease. A few days later, Ken called me, livid, because he had thought I had stolen all of his belongings out of our apartment. He said he went to check on the place and found the apartment completely cleaned out of all of his stuff. Everything I owned, untouched. There were no signs of a break-in. He and I were the only ones that had keys, and there was no reason or notice for the apartment managers to go into our space. I really was the logical culprit for the theft, but I hadn't been in the apartment either. I dropped by later that day to find things just as he said they were. All of his belongings were gone, even the fish tank. Everything I owned was just as I had left it, half stacked in boxes in the corner of the living room. As I sat in the dimly lit room trying to puzzle it out, I distinctly saw a shadow dash across the room accompanied by a flash of red. I spent the next week interrogating all of our friends, anyone who had who had access to that apartment. Everyone denied culpability. I was encouraging a confession as well. I thought it was hilarious. I wanted to know who had my back. Nobody came forward then, and more than a decade later, everyone involved still claims innocence. Mm. There is no logical explanation for it, and it's maddening. My instincts tell me that if it was a garden gnome, taking revenge on my loser boyfriend for living off of me for mm-hmm. all of those years. I still see dashing shadows and flashes of red sometimes, or hear a disembodied laugh coming from somewhere just behind where I'm standing. It's continued for an entire decade. It's become so familiar that I joke to my husband that he best make offerings to my garden gnome to avoid bad luck. These days, I have a coworker who reminds me of my protector, the gnome. He's wise and wrinkly, short and fierce, and sometimes, when we're deep in conversation, I catch a sparkle in his eyes that I've seen somewhere, a glint that's too familiar, And I have so many questions. Obviously, I just jumped right into this without any backstory. But I think the question is more important than my history, especially with the microdosing trend that's happening now. What if psychedelics open more than just different pathways in your mind? What if they open doors to other realms? And what if real entities can move through those doors once they've been opened? What if my garden gnome is real? And what if something more sinister comes through the ether when you open those doors? I might be crazy. But then again, as you say, if just one of these stories is true, Mm -hmm. I might just be completely sane then. And that just might be more terrifying than the alternative. This all makes me think about like from early on when when she started talking about the gnome. uh, I love that it was a gnome. I know, gnome. (laughs) And and for some reason, this this gnome entity made made my mind go to this place of some kind of version of simulation theory, which is, is, you know, essentially that we're living in the matrix. And like, let's say we are living in some kind of matrix where this is all very, very real to us. I mean, it doesn't actually change our reality much. It's like, you know, we still feel our emotions. We still live our lives and all that. But the thing that's interesting about this whole simulation theory, like Matrix stuff, is like, um, if it's if it's kind of like a video game that we're living in, where like it would open up the possibility of being able to manipulate so-called reality more. Mm-hmm. And what if like psychedelics and certain drugs, almost like a cheat code, uh-huh. where it's like you... Um, take this stuff and you're able to kind of like, kind of almost like when Neo gets unplugged. (laughs) Here we go. Yeah, it gets unplugged and he can see the matrix now and like learn how to like, you know, manipulate reality. Um, That if, when you take these things, what you're, I don't know, you're, you're accessing some different part of the game, so to speak. And, and then Red it, Dead. Mm-hmm, yeah, and then it allows you to like break the rules. Like, you know, you your thought of a gnome, whatever is in your subconscious. I don't know, maybe you had a memory of seeing a gnome before. Now this drug allows you to like manifest that thing in reality. I don't know. I don't know. Just a bunch of weird thoughts in my head. Well, that's nothing new. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just, I don't think, I don't know. This person sounds very like logical, mm-hmm. smart, educated. And even they're asking like, I don't know. You know, even they're saying this seems crazy. But after that one trip, 
seeing, you know, now shadows, hearing voices. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean to say that they sound sane in that I don't think that they were predisposed to some sort of mental illness. Like, I think that they went on this trip and they saw something and now that something is forever with them. Or maybe that something was always with them, but right. the, but the the trip allowed them to uh, suspend their disbelief yeah. long enough for it to like latch on. Yeah. And now it's like, because it, it doesn't sound evil. It actually sounds quite hilarious. Mm-hmm. I mean, stealing yeah. her boyfriend's because also that is like a weird this <laughs> without the boyfriend or ex boyfriend's missing stuff. It's not scary. It's not, it, yeah, but, it's just like a flashback, a very specific odd flashback. But but when it steals the, the stuff, mm-hmm. if, if that really happened, then it's like well, then this thing is a well, somebody it's, stole it's, his it's stuff. It's out there, yeah. And, yeah. If, and if this thing did it, <laughs> then this the, then this little thing is like out there doing stuff on its own. Well, and like. Because who breaks into somebody's place and only steals one person's stuff? How would you know that? Mm-hmm. And why wouldn't the friends, after all these years, be like, I did okay. it? Yeah. And, and he was a piece of junk. So it's like there, yeah. there wouldn't even be anger over the friend having stood up for her or, yeah. and, you know, backing her up. So that's like, and then, okay, and then also the ex-boyfriend's brother being like, did you see that gnome thing run across the road? There's just those two things that right. take it from being just a hilarious memory from a trip yeah. to something creepy questioning mm-hmm, uncomfortable mm-hmm. i'm gonna have to like really forget this story before we do shrooms again <laughs> i know yeah because now i'm looking at this guy our creepy yeah, note and i'm like oh god yeah i haven't had any, anything show up later um the closest like i've had to like flashbacks is just oh sometimes after a heavier trip like the next few weeks i'll have just moments of a anxious feeling uh-huh. that I'll snap back into the mindset I was in at certain points of the trip where like reality felt really bendy uh-huh. and unreal and I'll start feeling that creep up again. So far, I've always been able to like, no, 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 no. Don't lean into it. Yep, don't lean into it. That is not real. That you are a real person. This is a real world around you. Man, that's never happened to me. But things feel a little- so much stronger than you. <laughs> things feel a little little bendy. I Well, I like the bendy. My, my last trip was my funnest one. Like, mm-hmm. like I feel like I don't ever need to go past that point. I just like rode the back of a deer for several hours mm-hmm. and it was, we had a great time. Yeah, yeah. Although actually today I was driving and I saw a deer trying to clear the freeway and I was like, oh, what's up deer? <laughs> <laughs> Were you the one I was riding? <laughs> I mean, obviously I, <laughs> nothing got bendy. I wasn't concerned, but I don't know. Yeah. I, th- I think it's uh, something worth giving some merit to mm, especially mm. again as this as they even say like as people are really exploring shrooms more it's like be careful yeah you know it's like don't be willy-nilly and not just in the technical scientific sense but also in the spiritual paranormal sense i think it's something worth considering i, I mean even like some scientists i mean not to go too deep in a tangent on this but just really quick uh, i'm watching this netflix docuseries i think it's called how to change your mind mm-hmm. and um and they talk about the importance like like you know scientists that they've begun to do clinical research trials again with LSD specifically over in Switzerland. And they've started to do psilocybin trials again in different like places in the world. But I remember like the LSD like trials, this guy saying, and this was like a guy who I think this, if I remember the right guy was actually part of the uh, trials in the sixties as well. Mm -hmm. And and he was just talking about like the importance of setting and mindset, like set and setting. And with this drug, it's like it, um, or some of these hallucinogens, it's like, your emotional state, the, your surroundings will affect your trip so much, which made me think of like in the horror world, it's like, maybe don't do it in a dark basement full of candles with the Ouija board, uh. you know, like that kind of stuff where it's like, even even if it's not necessarily something paranormal that you could bring in, you could just bring in such a level of fear and anxiety, some, you could manifest some kind of monster right. that could really kind of fuck with your mind on some level. Maybe, maybe permanently on some level, like, right, like you, scare you can yourself. have little moments where it's uh-huh. like you'll you'll slide back into that setting and be like, ah, ah, no, 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 and you know, like be overcome with anxiety. I was just pick- Lindsay. That's where you were talking about, like the drums earlier. Yeah. And the way I've always understood it is like drums by nature are meant to split up a beat. It's supposed to actually put that's a division right. in. When you listen to like flowy music, it allows you to actually dive deep into what you're doing, and oftentimes mm. pulsating drums can keep you from breaking through that barrier. That makes sense. Interesting. That makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. I think of like, when I think of like a drum beat, also I think of like um, other cultures that, you know, really use music in a different way to like pray for rain or um, like ceremonies. Like it's a very different. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's the reverberation of drums as well as like a, brings you together in a way but it can also like logan saying like separate mm-hmm. you out yeah because they will use ceremonial drumming with some like i want to say like ibogaine which is a 
hallucinogen, really powerful hallucinogen that comes from Africa. It's the one Zero that I'm, interest. It's the one that I'm the most scared of. Yeah, um, you're not doing that. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I would only do it in a medical setting if I was ever to do it. But it was it was like um, I think ceremonial drumming was part of that. That makes sense. Yeah, that one sounds intense. Yeah. Sounds terrible, honestly. Okay, a little bit lighter. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, uh, on my side, I was mentioning that we haven't really talked about an energy attachment to an object in a while. Mm, um, and, yeah. and in fact, so this is about specifically about um, energy attached for uh, a- attached to a bracelet. And it made me think it was been a long time since I shared this story, but there was a family that went on a trip somewhere and this girl went off horseback riding and she found what was like a um an offerings altar Mm -hmm. and she removed a necklace and then carried it back with her and subsequently then like the young girl who had died whose necklace it had been she like brought that girl with her and do you remember that yes yes like a family vacation Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. so good such Mm -hmm. a great story so this this took me back to that and was that one set in mexico I, or I, something like that, yeah. I thought so, but I'm like, oh, Mexico, South America. Latin like, America, somewhere. Something, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever feel anxious about like purchasing something and then bringing something with you? No, or like actually. touching something and just... Mm-mm. Do you ever like... Um, do you ever touch something like... Uh, I'm trying to think of like something out in public that you would like have contact with where you're like, ooh, uh-uh. No, mirrors are the only things that bother me that way. Yeah. I wouldn't be really into like an antique mirror. Uh, well, I don't think you should be. <laughs> but you know, like a couple years ago for my anniversary, you bought me, my anniversary, our anniversary, you bought me that ring when we were oh, in. Oh yeah, uh, Grange, uh, no, Lewiston. Lewiston, Pullman. Oh, Pullman, there we Pullman. go. I was like, I was like, no, They're no, right side by side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same. Uh, I remember trying that ring on and thinking like, you know, this is a dangerous choice, but I, I was overcome with like so much love and, yeah. and there's a beautiful story behind that ring. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I do feel it. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Let's find out what's going on. Hey there, I'm a fairly new listener thanks to my husband who's been listening for a while. Funnily enough, I'm the paranormally sensitive one and he is the skeptic. That said, I thought you guys would appreciate my story. In 2017, we lived with our two sons, 18 months and three months, in a small garage that was converted into a casita and on the property of a family friend. My grandmother was living in an apartment alone, but she was getting up there in age and needed to be living full time with a family member. We were helping her consolidate her things when I found a pretty silver and turquoise bracelet I'd never seen before. I asked her if I could have it, and she happily agreed. I wore the bracelet the rest of the day and almost immediately began feeling strange. For instance, that evening while driving home, I almost made a left turn across a busy highway despite the clearly visible oncoming traffic. I have made this turn multiple times a day and was very familiar with this road and couldn't believe what had almost happened. I thought maybe I was tired or had just zoned out. Later that night, I developed a headache and felt like I was developing a cold and decided to go to bed early. That night, I had a dream unlike anything I had ever experienced or have experienced since. To preface this, I am not one of those people who has interesting, profound dreams. I have very random dreams that mimic everyday, mundane life, like going to dinner and then going home, and then that's the end of my dream. This night, I dreamt I was walking down a street when I passed by an apartment with a young boy staring out the window. I wish I could describe the feeling I was overcome with upon looking at this boy. Without explanation, I knew he was a ghost, but I knew I was not afraid. He was so, so sad, and as a mother of two young boys, I couldn't just leave him. I went into the apartment and picked him up. Without explanation, I knew his entire story. He was alone in the house because his mother had to work long hours to support them due to his father being a deadbeat drunk. I also knew that they had all died in a fire due to accidental negligence of the drunk father leaving the stove on. Some time passed with me simply sitting on the couch holding the boy. Eventually, the mother returned and was surprised to see me. She became frantic and attempting to usher me out the door but realized it was much too late. She told me I needed to hide and that her husband couldn't see me. I did what she said and crouched behind a counter. The husband entered the home in a drunken state and it turned out I hadn't picked a great hiding spot at all. The husband spotted me and became enraged. He began screaming, What are you doing here? Who are you? Leave us alone. Just charging at me. He soon was on top of me, attacking me, and then I woke up. Despite the terrifying end of the dream, all I felt was sadness and longing to help the little boy. I wanted to hold him again and comfort him. As I looked around my room, I saw the bracelet sitting on the dresser, and I had an odd feeling it was somehow connected to my dream. The next day, I felt uneasy in the house, which I had never felt before. 
I did not wear the bracelet that day and noticeably felt much more clear-headed and free of any symptoms I had had the day before. I called a friend of mine who is also sensitive to spiritual activity and we decided to cleanse the house, but she couldn't come help me for a few more days. That night, after feeling increasingly uneasy after my husband left for work, he worked graveyard shift, I placed the bracelet outside for the night. Too afraid to go to sleep, I turned on the lights in my bedroom, which was right off the living room where I was sitting watching TV. The way the rooms were set up, the light from my bedroom illuminated the wall in front of me. I began to hear my cat hissing in my bedroom. And when I looked behind me into the room, I saw her, who was normally a very calm cat, growling and hissing at something outside. I was already on edge, but was doing my best to rationalize this as to not go into a complete panic. I considered getting the boys and leaving, but whatever was bothering the cat was outside, and I was too afraid to open the door. And then suddenly, my cat came running out of my room and hid around the corner. And within a few minutes, I saw the shadow of a man walk in front of me, illuminated from the light in my room. It walked back and forth several times as I sat paralyzed in fear. I did my best again to rationalize what I had seen. Maybe it was the landlord who lived on the property. Maybe they had guests over. But after combing over every possibility, I realized one horrifying fact. If it was a regular person outside of the window, they couldn't have cast a shadow onto my wall because they would have been behind the light in my room, not in front of it. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, I did not sleep well that night. Actually, in fact, I stayed up until my husband got home from work because the activity always seemed to slow down when he was home. He has a very strong presence, and as a skeptic, I think that took away from the energy I was feeding into. That evening, that friend I had mentioned earlier and I had plans to walk around our city's weekly event where people came out to walk up and down Grand Avenue, enjoying local treats, farmer's markets, boutiques, and live music. I told her everything that had happened since we last spoke, and she asked to borrow the bracelet. I gave it to her, and she wore it for the rest of the the evening. At the end of the night, she confessed that she felt as if she was getting sick and wanted to go home to rest. She gave me the bracelet and we parted ways. That night was more uneasy feelings and shadows out of the corner of my eye, along with my three-month-old baby being unusually fussy. The next morning, my friend called and said that by the time she got home, all the feelings of sickness had completely subsided and she was absolutely fine. We realized we not only needed to cleanse the house, but also to dispose of the bracelet. I decided to give my grandma a call and ask her how she'd come across this thing. She told me she'd bought it at an estate sale, but didn't know anything about the person it had belonged to. We decided the best course of action would be to deliver the bracelet to a priest rather than trying to destroy it or cleanse it ourselves. As I waited for my friends to come help me cleanse my home, my six-month-old baby started crying unconsolably. Nothing I did to calm him would help and when he suddenly stopped bre- uh, and he suddenly stopped breathing. Mm. And listen, I know when a kid starts crying, they sometimes do that thing where they take a long, deep breath before letting out a huge scream. But this was not that. He looked surprised and panicked and began flailing his arms. His face turned purple, and this lasted about 10 seconds before the color returned to his face, and he was able to cry again. After the third time this happened, I felt absolutely helpless and decided to try to give him a bath. As I removed his clothes, I found three long scratches down his belly. I grabbed the two boys and ran out of the house until my friends arrived. They brought sage and special soap for our bodies. As they got ready, I bathed the boys to help cleanse them of anything that might be attached to them. The cleansing went fairly normally, except for a few places that seemed stubborn. One area in particular was the laundry room, where as soon as we walked in, the smoke would go out. Every time we would try to relight the bundle of sage, the smoke would simply go out immediately. We became more forceful with our demands for the spirits to leave the space, and eventually this area was cleansed as well. While this was the end of my supernatural interaction from this bracelet, it turned out that stubborn laundry room was something bigger than we realized. For some context, the land that this house was on was in a valley where many conflicts between indigenous tribes and Spanish colonizers, as well as battles in the Mexican-American War, had taken place. After the cleansing, my two friends left and went about their days as normal, after dropping the bracelet off with a priest, of course. However, the next day, my friend called me to tell me about a dream she experienced that night. She dreamed she was in a white room with a woman standing on the other side of the room. The woman appeared to be indigenous American, and she was carrying a bundle, a baby. The woman approached my friend, and she realized there was something wrong with the baby. The woman explained that the baby had been born deformed and taken from her shortly after birth and killed due to its deformity. She told my friend that she had awoken her, that my friend had awoken her, and that now she needed to provide her with a baby. That was the end of the dream, but she woke to find a text message from the other girl who would help us cleanse the house. She had had 
the exact same dream. Nothing evil befell either of my friends following this event, but my friend did tell me that for months afterwards, she would experience an overwhelming desire to have a baby and without getting into too much detail, explained to me that at times while having sex, she would have visions of the woman telling her that she was making her a new child. Isn't that terrifying? That is terrifying. That's like the worst, most like vulnerable. The only thing more vulnerable is like being in the shower or going to the restroom. Right, right. Yee. That's always so creepy when two people have the same dream. You know, like like especially like an abstract dream like that. Yes, like very uber specific. Yeah, like a lot of like very random specific details that like, ah. I mean, if they'd been, yeah, because I don't even know what things you'd have to talk about before then to have that exact same dream. Or like what movie or like <laughs> yeah, experience yeah. you would share. And then that's a good idea. Like that whole like cursed object, rather than destroy it, rather than like, you know, I don't know, throw it in a river or whatever, right. just take it to a priest. I know, or, or, I loved that. I was like, oh, yeah. I don't know that that has come up before. No, I and like, I imagine that the priest will, you know, perform some sort of like exorcism type thing, maybe put it in some sort of locked box. I mean, I don't know what mm-hmm. protocol is. Yeah, and I'm sure it varies considerably, denomination to denomination, priest to priest. If it's a more skeptical priest, he'd probably just be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then just like throw it in the garbage can. He's just like, he gives it to his mom for Christmas. <laughs> right, right. Set in his office. Yeah, I don't know. I know the shared dream thing is bizarre because we've we've also like discussed co dreaming, you know, or like mm-hmm. you're, you know, but uh, I think the only time I've ever had like a similar dream is like if we're going on a vacation or we've just talked about some like wouldn't it be cool if yes and then that's heightened the last, emotionally exactly and then like I'll wake up and be like oh my god I had like a cool dream about us living in Portugal you're like me too but like yeah that's, yeah that's not but the same the, oh yeah because that, that would have to be like you know, when we went there and there was this guy named Martin and Martin, I love Martin and Martin looked exactly like you know this and he had this color eyes and this color hair so and he weird. took us to this place because that would be like what the fuck like how did our dreams link up I know it would be kind of cool though. It would be cool. I mean, I would love to see you in my dreams. I know that would be um, super cool if we like saw each other in our dreams and had the same dream, like a nice dream, oh, like a sweet so dream, sweet. and and we're like sentient in each other's dreams, oh. like going adventures together. I would love that. Yeah, that's super cool. You want to meet me in my dreams tonight? Yeah, I try to. I never remember my dreams hardly ever. So no, I remember my dreams all too well. <laughs> I, I, I wish I didn't. It's not It's not always enjoyable. Yeah. I, I, as a kid, I did more. And then I don't know what it's been like the last 10, 15 years. Almost never. I sleep so deep. Mm, you do. And then, and it's then like I, annoying how deep you sleep. <laughs> and I just have no clue like uh, if I was dreaming or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also like, you know, when workloads change and you're, you know, we're in a different place with our kids and our work life. It's like yeah, there's not any not space in my head <laughs> right. for really good dreams because like when we first started dating remember, i would have dreams all the time of you cheating on me oh yeah you did do, go so through a series of weird. that it was really unfortunate because i would uh-huh. wake up so upset like uh-huh. i would oftentimes be crying yeah i just look at it like i just loved you so much i didn't want anything to happen to like you know harm our relationship and i was so fearful of losing you yeah maybe isn't that nice it is nice <laughs> uh, you want to do some annabelle shout outs yeah i'll start and i just want to say that mm. this i think so i've this list this week is quite short because these are everybody who's like hey i you said email if we didn't so i think we're i really think we're totally caught up again okay so all new annabelle's uh going forward hopefully would like to thank the following annabelle sorry if you didn't get uh this read earlier when you were hoping but now you're getting read to uh molly pritz bradley pease melinda filion uh milo prince karen croft anna pornicious clay jackie gatt Blake Palin, Cuesta Moran, and then it's Kisita. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh, the first name. You put the pronunciation in the back. Oh, I get it now. It's um, it's not Cuesta. It's um, Kiesta. There we go. Kiesta Moran Hein. There you go. You got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't read that until the And then uh, I was uh, a little bit distracted by the, the name Clay because my aunt was in town last night, and my aunt is very conservative. Uh-huh. Very funny lady. Very nice, but like doesn't like the cursing uh, doesn't like things to be, uh, you know, vulgar or whatever. And yet she came to see your stand up. She did. She did. Uh, I'm sure it was like, whoo, shuddering at a lot of it, but didn't say that. She didn't say anything to you about it afterwards. Nope. She was very, she's very good about that stuff. But then, uh, her son had played a trick on, trick on her. And it like during the softball game or watch him in a softball game. And she's like, um, I heard this really funny joke from this com- and It was like a very clean relationship joke. Okay. Um, you know, she didn't really tell it in like a funny way, but it was basically just like, 
you know, some guy he's having when he has trouble sleeping or whatever, he goes out the living room and and he's sitting there watching TV. And then his wife one night is like, "Well, you know, I'll just yeah, I didn't know you were coming out here when you couldn't sleep. I'll just start getting up and setting out with with here you with here with you as well." And then he's like, "Oh, that would be my worst nightmare." That was like the gist of what was talked about in the joke. And she's like, "Yeah, it's like an Andrew Dice Clay," and Andrew Dice Clay became. I hear Logan laughing like, like, so hard, and I'm like. It wasn't Andrew Dice Clay because Andrew Dice Clay. I'm like that's surprising because he became famous for like having the most filtered material ever. I, I was so confused. I'm like, does she know what she's saying? It was Nate Bergazzi, <laughs> who's like a very but her son <laughs> had messed with her and told her like, oh yeah, that was Andrew Dice Clay. Like, oh my god! I, I think trying to get her to look up more Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we need to call Andy. That is yeah, fantastic. Pretty funny. Yeah, good job, Andy. Oh my god, that is great. That is great. All right, well, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles. Yuli and Alex, Cynthia Garcia, Destiny Hensley, Noah York, Marissa Doyle, Becca Canan. Uh, it's not Canaan. There's no E. Hmm. K-I-N-N-A-N. Canan. Becca Canan. Becca, yeah. Becca Can Can. <laughs> uh, Donna Davis and Vigil Fox. Yeah, thanks to all of you. Yes, and then I have a few spooky shout outs. Oh, also on your list, you said Jackie Gat. Uh, last week when I gave mm-hmm. you Jackie's name, yeah, uh, I wrote Jackie Cat instead of Jackie Gat. Oh, so this is the infamous Jackie Cat. Jackie sent an email and I was like cracking out. They were like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Like they were such a good sport about it. Jackie Cat Cat. Well, there was Jackie Cat and then there was somebody else that was something else cat. And like, you know, we wanted them to get married and have Oh, yeah, cat yeah, yeah. And she's like, sorry, that's oh, not even my name. God. Uh, so great all right to michael from Alyssa, ivy lily and paisley happy birthday thanks for being the best friend and creepy peepee and father to our spoopy girls to mark from morgan i love you with all of my heart and soul forever and ever to joel from jacqueline happy birthday to binks buddy and ella from heloise and lucy tell your mom our mom says hey sister Uh. to gabriel from your mom ellie Happy birthday to my April Fool's boy and to TJ from JoJo. Happy birthday. Aw, so cute. So sweet. And that's our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C. for working on social media with Ryan Handelsman and his team. And to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. And thanks, Logan, for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing the listener stories for book number four. Thank you to producer Sophie Evans for finding the first story I told this week, and to Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee for working on the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you'd like to watch the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content, and to see pictures that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. We also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, tons of horror-loving members to meet. And you can follow us on TikTok, also at Scared to Death Podcast, if you want some highlights from the shows, um, get little little condensed versions. Well, I guess not really condensed versions of the whole show, but you know what I mean. Just little, just little moments, little snippets. And, totally. and if you don't want to hear uh, more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad-free. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. It is Max. (laughs) (laughs) I love that show.